Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Good to see see you guys. We've got a few people um, <clears throat> who may be trickling in, but it's five thirty, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to pause for just about 30 seconds because I see the, the the participant number going up here. So I want to give everybody an opportunity to get in. And as people are coming in, I just want to um, thank everybody being here. Thank our elected officials who, who have joined us tonight. It looks like Council Councilman Herndon is here. And um, if anyone else is here, thank you so much for being here. Um, as always, thank you to our, our to you, the steering committee members, for the work that you're doing, for being here, for giving up your time and spending it on, on this most important topic. And um, to community members that are here and may, may be listening in this evening, want to say welcome to you as well. Want to remind all of our steering committee members that um, if you make comment, uh, be sure that uh, in the two column that you click on everyone if you want if you want to make a comment for everyone if you're just making a comment to me or to the panelists or to, to the panelists click on host and panelists um, um, going over the agenda this evening one second here um, so tonight, um, we'll open up tonight with a, with, a, with a bit of a conversation about um, meeting in person, and we'll kind of talk through that. We won't make a decision on that, but we'll talk about that and get some feedback, and then we'll do some follow-up via email in terms of uh, voting um, after people have had some ch a chance to process and look at their schedules and, and think about things. Um, and then we'll hear, we'll, we'll have some uh, presentations on affordable housing tonight. Uh, we'll look at the site framework concept, uh, the continuation of that. Um, uh, Muhammad, we're not making a decision because I want to give people an opportunity to process, to look at any personal things that they may have, but we'll definitely have a discussion tonight that will allow people to do that. We'll make, we'll send out a, a doodle, uh, not a doodle poll, but we'll send out a, a survey to, to make a vote um, using e-business and then get everybody updated right away. But I don't want people to feel pressured to make a decision tonight in case they have to check on things, family, COVID, things of that nature. Um, we'll go into public comment and then we will wrap up with information about our next meeting, which will be Tuesday, June 14th. Um, so with that being said, we'll jump right in. And so I want to open it up to the group um, to have a conversation about meeting in person. And so there's been some conversation about meeting in person. Originally, the conversation centered around meeting in person at the at the site, at the Park Hill Golf Course, um, after some of the steering committee members had an opportunity to uh, go walk walk the site, be there, see, you know, see it in person, do those kinds of things, and, and just the overall feeling of having an opportunity to um, kind of gather in person and, and have some of these conversations there. Um, after that, looking into it, we found out a couple of things. Uh, the first thing is if we um, meet in person at the Park Hill Golf Course, we would not have a virtual option uh, because of the technology limitations there. Um, and um, we could meet in person downtown um, at the Webb Municipal Building. Um, and if we did that, um, you know, there's just some things to think about in terms of the meeting starts at 530, parking, paying for parking, uh, people's comfort with COVID being in the, being in a larger building, um, and, and some of, some of those types of things. Um, so just wanted to open it up and just get people's general thoughts or feelings about uh, in general, being in person, and then, you know, the ability to be in person uh, at the Park Hill Golf Course with the understanding that there's no virtual option, um, or being at the municipal building where there might be a virtual option. I understand there is one, Courtney. There is a virtual option there. Um, 
and then just kind of for people logistics on you know can you know can you make a 5 30 start time getting downtown some of those other things that we may need to take into consideration uh, for some people who are managing this process virtually home kids things of that nature so i'll stop there and just kind of want to open it up and hear from folks Hi, Dr. Ross, this is Patty. I was just thinking that if it's gonna, if we want a hundred percent of participation, we should probably make it as easier as possible for people to participate. And if that's virtual, then be it. I mean, I would love to be in person, but I'm gonna be out of town during that time. I can definitely be virtual. So it's okay if it's hybrid, but I know working with volunteers, et cetera, it's also really hard to get downtown or in another location. So I don't want you guys to pick because of me because I'm just one person, but I just want I just wanted to say that. Yeah, thank you. And then I think one thing that we could consider, um, you know, I, I can't speak for the city, but if if the thought is, um, you know, seeing the site again, I think that we could look to schedule one more walkthrough um, at the site for those who couldn't make the first one. If that if that's something that um, would be helpful for individuals as well, Lisa? Um, yeah, I'm wondering if there's another option um, in terms of being able to do hybrid without having to go downtown. I'm thinking like the Carla Madison Rec Center or another one of the rec centers or other public buildings that are in the Park Hill area that maybe wouldn't require us to go all the way into downtown. Just an idea. Thank you. I think a consideration with a hybrid meeting um, is the ability for a location to a host enough of who would want to meet in person but also have polycom so we'd have to think about okay our would every steering committee member bring a laptop how would they interact each and be able to see what the chat is saying from people who are at home is there a polycom option at the the carl madison rec center or another rec center I don't, A, I don't know if they do or if it's reliable. I was saying that if we wanted to have an in-person meeting with a hybrid, you know, a hybrid approach, uh, we know that the web building, city and, county, city and county building does have that technological capability of a polycom and we could um, make that work because we're familiar with the technology. We simply just don't know how we would um, pull that, that off on other locations because you have to have the room set up with that camera and um, Wi-Fi, things of that nature. Others? And I see the comments in the chat, thank you. This is Chandi. I guess I would also agree with those who want to make sure that it's still accessible. So hybrid, if it can be accessible to everyone, um, and if if that means we need to stay virtual, like 100% virtual, I'm okay with that. Um, I am interested in uh, another site tour, if possible, just because I was unable to attend, but. Um, I'm also curious if that could be opened up more broadly to community and that could be a way for this group as well as community to come together on the site um, without needing it to be an official hybrid meeting. Okay, thank you. Uh, Reverend Downing, would you, do you mind asking your question? I'm, I, I'm not sure I understand it. I wanna make sure um, it's answered correctly. Yes, sir. Uh, I was just curious as to whether maybe we could utilize if there's not um, video conferencing technology available in some of those nearby sites, if maybe <clears throat> a teleconference option in one of those places is feasible. Oh, yeah. So it's feasible, but from a facilitation standpoint, I, I can't see somebody on the phone 
And right, so right. Trying to manage that and making sure, especially if it's a steering committee member, um, that we're, you know, seeing when they have questions and, and, and things like that. And then also making sure that we don't lose the um, ability to communicate effectively. Got it. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes. Okay. Had it not been for COVID, um, wouldn't these be live meetings? Wouldn't we be having yeah. live meetings? Yeah, so I, I so yes, we would. Um, so what is the difficulty? Well, the difficulty is, is people have planned for a virtual meeting. Um, and like the start time, right? And that's why we're having this conversation, right? The start time at 5.30, where if somebody's working from home, being able to log in at 5.30, maybe just fine, but starting at 5.30 downtown, finding parking, paying for parking, some of those things could be an issue, daycare could be an issue. Um, so without knowing people's situations, without discussion, um, how they're managing the virtual experience, we wanna, wanna be respectful of that and, and provide that opportunity. And if Mohammed, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Mohammed. then so I will go to you, Courtney. Sorry about that. Go ahead, Courtney. If in-person is desired, but the, the timing is an issue, we can also look at um, change, you know, we don't have to start necessarily at 5.30. We could start at 6 or 6.30 if that's what the, the committee so desires. We're open mm -hmm. and flexible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're really looking to you to hear what, you, what your thoughts are around, around this. There's no right or wrong answer. There's just um, really hearing from you to see what you're thinking so we can look at potential options or or keeping things virtual. Mohammed? Um, expanding on Lamont's question there, Courtney, there was no commitment by the city at the start of year that all meetings in 2022 will be virtual. Was there? Uh, we did not commit to say that 100% of the meetings would be virtual. No, we didn't. Okay, that. so that, you know, the steering committee and the city do have the right that they can change the meetings depending on um, restrictions and whatnot. And um, remind me again, what are the guidelines from the city and county of Denver are regarding COVID at this point? Are all events back in in-person or certain events back in online? Um, we do have some meetings in person now. Okay. So my thing is, uh, I did the same thing with my neighborhood meeting. We did uh, online meetings, did in-person meetings. The crowd that we get at in-person meeting is very different from people who we get on online meetings. We talk about equity here. Uh, not everybody has access to internet. Un unfortunate as it is, everybody doesn't have access to internet or a computer to join these online meetings. So there is some inequity with these virtual meetings as well. So ideally we should be doing both virtual and in-person meeting, a combination of those two, so we can get the maximum participation from the, um, all, um, participation from the um, people as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Mohammed, the, the, I don't disagree with that. Um, and that's why we're having this conversation to see if there needs to be a shift. But I think that when we're talking about an equity situation, we have to understand that everybody doesn't have a car, everybody doesn't have money to pay for parking. And so that that, convert, that equity conversation is one that goes both ways, which is why we have to, um, again, have this conversation and, um, and the meeting, you know, in terms of participation, the steering committee participation is what, you know, we're, we're, what we're looking for, right? Because you guys have made, made this commitment and, anything that takes away from your participation. Right now, you know, with the exception of going out of town or being sick or anything like that, we've had, you know, pretty much um, full participation from the committee. And if we can continue that in person, I think that's great. Um, if we can, I think that's something we need to consider. Um, we also need to consider um, just everybody's thoughts. The reality is, is people think differently about COVID and so, Whereas we started in the beginning, 
virtual. Some people signed up because that's what they felt like their participation was going to be. And a change in that may, may change their participation. And so just having the conversation to make sure everybody's comfortable or just know what our options are is, is why we're having this conversation and also why we weren't going to have a vote tonight because I want people to have the opportunity to process and look at things. Um, you know, sometimes when you sleep on it, maybe you have a different opinion or you're able to look at your calendar or you look at things and, and see something different. So um, Kenneth and then Patty. I, I just wanted to um, get a clarification, Mohammed. Was your point that if we have an in-person, if we have a hybrid and you have an in-person, did you want that in-person location in the neighborhood? Was that the concern or was it just to, to have both? And I just was wanting clarification there. Uh, so my thought process for having the meeting at the Park Hill Golf Course site itself was, first of all, nobody has to pay for parking there. There's plenty of parking there. Um, and then we're not struggling to find parking there. The other thing is if we are deciding the fate of that site and some of has, has never see, seen that site and even people who, you know, the public who are look, attending these meetings, I think it will be a great experience for everybody to be on the site while we are talking about it. So that was my thought process. I am not 100% married to the, having the meeting at the site itself. We can have a rec center. We can have at the web building. I'm just saying that my reasoning for being it on Park Hill Golf Course is we are deciding the fate of that property. We should be there. Great, thank you. Patty? Yeah, I was going to agree with Mohammed. I think if we do, I, I agree that it might, it might bring people that haven't had a chance to say something or to talk about it in a different way. And, and I don't know that it necessarily had to be a Zoom meeting. I mean, I'll be okay with just calling in a conference call like we used to do all the time, or, you know, or maybe I can get brief or like, or look at the recording later. But I feel like we need to make it convenient for people that live around here to be able to be part of it if it's going to be in person. Okay, other thoughts? Yes, Mohammed, that's correct. Right, so if we were, um... 100% in person, and we've done this past, you know, pre-COVID, our meetings typically would have not been hybrid or, or virtual. Um, the public is always welcome to observe our, our meetings. Um, they would come in and they would have a time at the end of the meeting to address the steering committee, um, but it would be a sign-up sheet. Um, but it'd be 100% virtual or in person. We didn't typically record those meetings in the past. What we would do is we would take uh, good notes and we would post those notes um, online after the meeting. So we're working at, you know, this, you know, posting on the um, web page after the, the virtual meeting. That's why it is nice because you can record the meeting. And Patty, did you read, did you raise your hand again or is that the same hand? Oh, okay, cool. I didn't. Sorry, want... I just need to. Yeah. No, you're good. I I didn't put it down, so I, didn't, I wanted to make sure I didn't miss you. Okay. Well, I think that what we can do is is again kind of look at what some what the options are again for Park Hill Golf Course. Um, look in uh, if it's possible, Courtney. Maybe look into like what, what, what a rec center setup is, um, the web building setup, and then just the, um, um, what the parameters are um, for, you know, what, what we need to do in terms of posting and sharing information, what the process is pre-COVID versus now versus virtual, get all that figured out. Um, we, can, we can share that. Um, and then also in the chat, it looked like there's a, an offer to host at New Hope, which is across the street uh, from the property. Um, and I don't know what to, the technology is. And so uh, Reverend Donna, we can follow up with that. Um, uh, and, and, and just kind of go from there and, and uh, get that 
get that information out to you guys and then we can um you know and have any follow-up uh, questions if there are any uh with e-business and then and just kind of take a vote and see how people are feeling and go from there um but um but i appreciate everybody sharing your thoughts and um and um looking at you know what we can do and we'll also look into separately the opportunity to set up uh, just one more walkthrough um around the property and um for those who didn't get to do that because that might help this as well so okay so we've got some we got our marching orders on that um thank you for your input uh courtney did you have something yep that's great we can provide additional details via email about the the different options and constraints um you know with experience with hybrid meetings um and, and what technology we need for it to work and and what that would potentially look like um so yeah, we will, we will be in touch. Thank okay, you. great. And then just, just to respond to the chat, um, just as a facilitator, I, I really love the fact that these meetings are recorded um, because you can see and hear everything versus you know reading notes. And so um, that is a nice feature. And I think it, it helps um, mm -hmm. transparency and connecting with everyone. Because even if you don't have a computer at home and you want to do this, you can get to the library, you can get phone and so I like you know that's yeah. just a personal um thing that I've enjoyed as a facilitator throughout COVID it's something that's shifted the way we do certain aspects of business so thank you again everyone for your comments on this and um we're going to transition over to uh to Brad to talk about um affordable housing considerations Brad Thank you, Dr. Ross. Good evening, everybody. My name is Brad Weinig. I'm a staff with the Department of Housing Stability or host here at the city and county of, of Denver. And, and, and my role tonight is really to help, I think, tee up some, some considerations for you all as, as, as a steering committee to consider as you're evaluating the potential for affordable housing, different types of affordable housing, land uses, trade-offs, all of those concepts. I know we've kind of touched on it, you know, in very brief instances and in prior steering committee meetings, but obviously tonight is 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 a big one. Um, I, I'm going to try to go through and just in, in tee up a little bit of kind of background and maybe some 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 questions to to think through or evaluate as we're having these conversations. Um, Dr. Ross or, or Courtney, as I'm going through it, I'm happy to be interrupted. So if you're seeing a question pop up in the chat or somebody raising their hand, you know, please feel free to to stop me. Um, and, and interrupt and, and have the conversation. Um, hopefully, um, those of you been on the steering committee have had a chance to review and spend a little bit of time with, I think, some of the material that hopefully Dr. Ross distributed to you in terms of some reading information, some information about our department, some video explainers around kind of what is affordable housing. But I think just to, to reiterate what we're talking about here, when I, when I say affordable housing, we're talking about affordable, capital A affordable, if you will, therefore income restricted. So not affordable you know, by accident, but affordable intentionally and recorded as such. Um, we consider housing to be affordable when 30% when of a household's kind of gross income and, no, and really no more is applied towards the costs of, of, of housing. So rent, mortgage, insurance, those kinds of things. And the intent there, right, is to leave sufficient um, additional income and resources for all other life necessities like food, healthcare, transportation, education, childcare, savings, et cetera. Um, and then I, I know it's come up also at some questions, but you know our, our mechanism kind of to ensure long-term affordability and ongoing compliance. Really, you know, we do have those tools. We record um, restrictions against properties. We record covenants, and we have a, an asset management and compliance department that ensures kind of ongoing compliance and affordability. So we do have kind of mechanism to hold, you know, feet to the fire, if you will, in terms of what's being committed on any one particular phase or master development. Um, you know, of, of all different scales and sizes. And, and, and typically, you know, our goal is to really ensure long-term affordability and, and, and where we're moving as a department and as a city is really looking at kind of 99 years of, of affordability to ensure that we've got a long-term ongoing kind of relative affordability mix throughout our, our city as much as we can. So go ahead, Dr. Ross, or whoever's driving. I don't know who's driving the- Courtney. Okay. Um, Oftentimes within the affordable housing world, you, you'll hear or see references to AMI or area median income. Um, that is simply a, a kind of a measure of the median income in the surrounding kind of Denver, Aurora, Lakewood, 
um, region and, and relative affordability or relative income compared to the median. And oftentimes the mechanisms that we have speak to a percent of area median income or AMI. And, and, and again, we, we tend too often to talk in numbers and percentages and acronyms. And, and this is really intended to kind of, you know, bring us all back to the fact that this really is about people and individuals and a variety of, of, of workers and members of our community who increasingly struggle to be a part of it because housing costs are continuing to rise at much faster paces than incomes. And so what you'll see here are just examples of different kind of, um, you know, categories of of employers, of employees, of workers in the, in the city based on um, labor statistic data and where they might fall in that AMI spectrum, depending on the size of their household, which is also important to consider, right? So, you know, a, a, a single individual, single person household that works in food service earning the $27,530 might qualify in the kind of 30 to 50% AMI range. But if he or she has a kid or two or another household member who doesn't have income, right? They, they start to kind of fall further down that income AMI spectrum. And so I just wanted to make sure that kind of, you can refer back to this, but this is what I what we mean when we're talking about um, area median income um, as it relates to these kinds of different mechanisms to ensure affordability. Go ahead. Um, so again, we are not, I'm not here to prescribe any one type or typology of affordable housing. I'm simply here to kind of let you know that there are a variety of different examples and typologies of what affordable housing can and does look like, right? So these are examples that I believe are taken from Blueprint Denver, um, you know, ranging from kind of different sizes and scales, different mechanisms, different populations served. And I'm not going to go through each of these in, in detail, right? But the point is that all of these have specific targeted populations and requirements that that come with them and enforcement mechanisms behind them to ensure that they remain affordable to the targeted population. So everything from kind of permanent supportive housing where um, you know wraparound services are provided for the population that lives in the building and oftentimes in the surrounding community in one place um, to kind of workforce restricted housing where really it's just a matter of you know restricting rents or for sale prices to to you know kind of 30 to 80 percent AMI households. We have age restricted examples. So you have to be of a certain age to be able to live in some of these communities, live work options where maybe there's a there's a, also a studio art component on the ground floor, or some other maker space with a residential component above it. Um, missing middle housing, right? Kind of the townhomes, duplexes, quadplexes, those kinds of things also tend to be relatively more attainable. And again, I, I underline examples because these are examples. Um, and, and just to kind of to, I guess, eliminate maybe any perceived notions of what affordable housing is or isn't. It can take a variety of shapes, sizes, heights, structures, and, and, and populations served. And all of those are, are available. We've got mechanisms within my department to support, you know, and, and encourage the ongoing compliance with all those different programs. Go ahead, Dr. Ross. Um, I, th I thought it was important. I know it's come up in a, in a variety of different contexts in these meetings in the past, and I think some requests that have come into the city, but it's, it's, this is also an example of what I just talked about, right? So if you just kind of zoom out a little bit around the Park Hill Golf Course area, there are examples of a variety of different kind of existing and proposed um, affordable housing um, developments, right? And so you'll see kind of starting in the northwest corner, you're all probably aware if you've been to the site across the street directly to the west is a just over 100 units of permanent supportive housing so that's kind of you know designed to serve um, residents who are formerly homeless and need additional in addition to a, a roof and a safe place to, to sleep and live need additional wraparound services that are provided on site um, across Colorado that green square is is more of the kind of the restricted workforce housing type where you know rents are restricted at a, at a lower level to ensure that that folks who are working in, in, in lower wage jobs are able to afford a, a safe and decent and quality um, apartment in this case. To the north of that, the Urban Land Conservancy is working through a proposed, um, you, you know, kind of master development to include a, a variety of phases. What I'm aware of and what they've kind of incorporated into their zoning request from the city is a plan for, in the first phase, roughly 40 for sale homes with, I believe, at least half of them 
um, income and price restricted at a, at, a, at a lower AMI level, as well as the potential for maybe one or two future phases of um, affordable housing, although details at this point have not really been determined, at least that I'm aware of. Um, further to the east, uh, that kind of longer rectangle is, is a newly um, awarded and, and to be developed low-income housing tax credit rental property serving a broader AMI range, 30 to 80 percent AMI, uh, with a total plan of 253 units that uh, I, I imagine will be completed in you know 18 months to, to 24 months time. And then uh, an existing um, age-restricted senior rental property just in kind of the south end of the the map here, Dahlia Senior, and I think I got that location right. I might be a, a block off or, or so, but but again, it's an 88 unit age and income restricted community. So this serves both as kind of providing context for what already is in the community in terms of restricted affordable, what's planned, and also serves as an example of kind of the, the variety and typology that, that affordable housing can, can, can take on. Um, so I wanted to make sure I, I got that across um, as part of this conversation. Go ahead, Dr. Ross. And so again, um, I think these are examples um, uh, of, of the types of, of housing that, you know, if the community believes it's important, can, can, can be incorporated into the overall master land use plan for the golf course, arranging, you know, again, these are, these are examples not meant to be exhaustive, um, but kind of, you know, restricted townhomes or, 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 or flat for sale developments that are, that are in kind of price restricted and typically priced um, for households in the 80 to 120% um, AMI range, um, you know, on the, on the other extreme end, supportive housing, again, with kind of rent restrictions, probably vouchers involved that are kind of, you know, lowest income, most vulnerable population in need of additional wraparound services in addition to residences, you know, rental housing for, for seniors, rental housing for our kind of, again, lower income workforce. Um, and then also, right, as the direction that we're kind of moving in as a city is, Really trying to ensure that you know market rate developments themselves even include um, integrated uh, in income restricted affordable units. Um, again, typically kind of in that sixty to eighty percent AMI range. Um, I want to make sure that it's known that each of these right um, can can certainly accommodate and even you know be prioritized for um, are conducive to larger families, right? So if, 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 if really the need identified by the steering committee and surrounding community is for, for, for more and deeper affordable family housing with you know, three and four bedroom types, that's a conversation that we should have and, and, and figure out how to kind of best incorporate that, recognizing that you know, with that typically comes maybe an expectation of a lower number of units overall, because typically the larger they go and or the deeper affordable they get down the income spectrum, you know, the harder it is to kind of finance via the market or the more dollars or subsidy you might need from the city and host to be able to support. And so again, these are meant to be examples. And what I'm hoping that maybe we can start to have a conversation as a group tonight is, you know, among these, right, which ones do you believe ought to be, you know, prioritized, right? In theory, all of them are, are possible, but which ones are most important? Which ones do you feel like are, are most needed? Which ones aren't appropriate or needed at this site, you know, in your, in your opinion and why? And also, you know, what other typologies, what other types of, of housing solutions do you want to, to see incorporated that maybe aren't on this slide? And so we can start to get a picture of what we need to be incorporating into our conversations as we negotiate these things and try to get them kind of codified so that if and when affordable or if and when development does happen on the site, that we all feel good about the, the kind of commitments being made with respect to affordable housing. And, and I have another, I think, slide next to talk about the kind of software. So it isn't necessarily limited to the you know 155 acre confines of the golf course, but I think let's, if, if you're okay with Dr. Ross and Courtney, maybe you know pausing here, making sure if questions have come up that we try to answer them and then start to get feedback from, from the members of the steering committee, um, you know, on some of these, on some of these focus questions, reactions, desires, um, goals for the property. Yeah, do we, do we have any um, questions from any of the steering committee members at this time? And I see hands raised one second. Uh, Jermaine? 
Yes, I, I, I agree with that. Um, that is nice and all. And I do believe that for the golf course or whatnot, even though we're talking about a natural park or whatnot, I feel like we need those units in the golf course as well as a store. If you're going to build all these units, you got to have um, things to accommodate those people that are moving in into that area. So with that being said, I feel like we're going to need that a lot of that um, affordable houses, houses that single parents could own instead of big businesses. Knowing what the city is doing now as far as um, trying to take care of the old redlining uh, discussion, uh, I've seen that as well this week. Um, with that, I feel like in order to keep everybody happy, you have to accommodate things for everyone and not just us living between 25 and 40 or whatnot, but the elderly, they need things to do. The kids need things to do. Um, with that being said, there's a lot of things and opportunities that we could present with that. Um, that's that's all I have to say right there. Any other questions or comments from steering committee members? Uh, Sade and then Lamon. Yeah, I really like the idea of the for, um, of workforce and family affordable rental housing. But with the concentration of that missing middle housing, I feel like there is an opportunity as we were talk talking about wealth building um, for families to have an opportunity to own housing. So for me, workforce, family, affordable, family, affordable rental housing is where like I'm going to. I'm not really leaning that much on the senior affordability, affordability yeah. rental housing just because we have um, senior housing in Park Hill. Okay. So, and then we have a homeless facility um, housing us off of 40th. And so that's what first comes to my mind. And I just wanted to share. Thank you, Sade. Thank you. Um, Lamone? So a couple of things, as far as the senior affordable housing, we do have people in my age group who will be seniors in the future who don't wanna live the, leave the neighborhood. So we do need to consider affordable housing for seniors because when you retire, you're not living on 100% of your salary, you're down around what, 40, 50%. So the, the affordable senior housing does need to be considered. Uh, my other question is, I see the percentages, but what does that equate to right now in real money? 80% to 120% AMI, what is that dollar amount right now? Yeah, thank you. I was going to ask you, Dr. Ross, if you go back, but you can kind of see it again. This is somewhat of a busy slide, but if you look at it, so the 80% AMI category, Lamone, for, for a household of one, right, the kind of upper income limit is just under $56,000 for a family of four, it gets up to $80,000, right? So it does, it scales with family size, but that would be the income that you would need to kind of have, you know, to be, to be below in order to qualify for a unit that would be restricted at 80% AMI. So that's kind of how you would read that, that chart, if that, if that makes sense. Does that answer your question, Lamont? Yeah, I'll study it later. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I know it's it's a lot and it's complicated, mm -hmm. but it's a good question. Thank you. Patty and then Mohammed. Yeah, I I think that that's a really big question for you guys to ask of us. I think with the points that Lamont is making and everybody else, I think that it would be better for us to make or to if we if there's data behind it. I think it's better for us to make a, a suggestion. I feel like if there's data of like how many people live here right now that will be elderly in the next 10 years, would they need a house, you know, housing? And will those houses be available for others like family to buy? And I mean, I think we just need to see in data the numbers of the people that live here versus what we want to offer. So I just think there's a really big question with that data of like what's needed in the neighborhood of what we have currently and what we want to do for the future. Does that make sense? It does. And I know that there's that that work has, has kind of 
been done a bit by, um, I believe, Ar Arland um, Economic Solutions or Arlene Taniwaki have, have done some background analysis. I think there's probably more to be done. There's been some surveying done as well to try to get at that data. I mean, the reality, Patty, is that I think there is certainly pent up demand for all of these, right? And that, and that you know, it, it's we're not going to solve the affordable housing crisis, even in the area, right, with, with, with just what goes into this part. But it's an important, you know, potential opportunity to start chipping away at Again, based on these conversations, based on data, what is most important? And so, I mean, yes, all of this, you know, can and should be data informed. And you know, we we as a department track and use data as much as we can. And in entering the process of even upgrading our kind of our database and our dashboard and what we share broadly around our new strategic plan goals and you know, household served and 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 the race of those households and the the, the income levels that they that they have and why these options exist. And so, you know. It is it is data informed. We know that there's significant demand for for all of these examples and more, right? In the in the surrounding area. Yeah, I think the data will help us not make like an emotional decision of what we <laughs> sure. do now because this might not happen for another five years. So sure. that could change our mind of what we really need. Then, so you know what I mean. It's a great point. Thank you, Patty. Mohammed. So could you go back to the um, AMI slide, please? Sure, one second, hold on. So Courtney, you said in the chat that these are 2021 AMI number, the slide says 2020 numbers, which one is correct? Oh, it says 2021 at the bottom. Um, the year of labor, it says sources post 2021 income limit. Yeah, okay. 2021 figures. So, and, and, um, and by the way, those are adjusted every year by, um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development or HUD, right? So it's not like we don't have say in what those numbers are. This is purely based on kind of census-based data and the and the regional income levels for households. So uh, we are, um, let's say we are looking in 2023, then we will, we, when we have 2022 data, these numbers would change. This does not include the current um, conditions that we have right now. The, 8.5% inflation that we have going on that is not reflected in this slide. No, right? that, that, that is not reflected. And again, the idea here is that, you know, it, it doesn't mean that like the rent is locked in forever, right? Or the sales price is locked in forever. What it means is that the rent or sales prices can't grow at a at a rate faster than, than incomes, right? And because it solves for at least the problem of what's been happening is the cost of living, the cost of everything has been increasing faster than, than the level of incomes, right? And so the gap keeps widening. And at least what, what these mechanisms are designed to do is that the relative affordability is maintained over a long period of time. So that if incomes in our region only go up by 3%, right? That, that, that the cost of these affordable units don't increase by more than 3%, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you. Uh, Kenneth? Yeah, thanks for the presentation, Brad. Uh, really thorough. A couple of things, um, thinking about um, other ideas. Uh, one is um, that we haven't really talked about is a community land trust. I know that's a model that's coming out um, in a lot of different situations to create permanent affordability and, and is often matched with um, for sale housing. So I wonder if you could give uh, some uh, uh, background on that. And then the other thing would be, um, I also know that the city right now is working on a prioritization policy um, that would um, potentially uh, give priority for yeah. folks uh, to return to a neighborhood. Um, and I wonder if you could give a little um, background on that as well and sure. get some comments from the group. Yeah, thank you, Kenneth. And, I, and that the prioritization poly is on the on the next uh, slide, but I want to make sure we get there. So thank you for bringing it up. Um, and your your point about community land trust is a good one, and that's my mistake for not in, you know kind of including that as as an example. But there are you know a few community land trusts. Again, there's no one type or size or right wrong way to do a community land trust. But a couple of examples, if you've heard of Elevation Community Land Trust or Habitat for Humanity recently merged with a, a what was formerly the Lowry Community Land Trust to create kind of a structure. But the idea is that there is a nonprofit organization who owns the underlying land and real estate and therefore has you know some ability to ensure that, that, that kind of what happens there is in the vision of, of community benefit and, and that they can step in if things go wrong. And then they would lease 
land right to a to an owner right so maybe the uh, an income restricted or income qualified owner would own you know the improvements of the home but pay a small monthly lease payment for access to the land underneath their home if you take the land out of the cost of of, of housing right it, it it makes the it, it bites off of you know it, it makes the housing more affordable right and it also ensures ongoing stewardship that's what you know those organizations are really good at uh, the flip side the urban land conservancy is also kind of a version of a land trust and it doesn't have to be limited to um housing right there can be you know office space or nonprofit spaces or other kinds of community beneficial spaces that are incorporated within a land trust type structure so i think you know your, your point about land trust is a good one and certainly there are examples of, of of very successful land trust entities in our region you know who could all or each individually play play a role here if that were a desire right of, of the steering committee so thank you for bringing that up um and, and i guess while we're at it let's just go ahead and go to the next slide so they're kind of plant the seating as well dr ross but you know i think in addition to the bricks and mortar you know kind of physical manifestation of affordable housing it's also important for the steering committee to be aware of a variety of kind of citywide and or you know kind of software tools kind of mentioned the prioritization policy that is currently in development but the idea is exactly that right that um, we we provide a, a certain set aside of income restricted affordable units that are created throughout the city for households who you know have been displaced from the city and are looking to come back or who are at risk of being involuntarily displaced based on a number of, of risk factors and, and literally prioritize those households and put them at the top of a of a wait list and, and give them you know every every better odd to get access to um you know kind of affordable housing we're excited about what what that means for kind of addressing displacement and i think you know this is a an, an excellent um example of, of of a community where this really you know i think we can we can frankly test the the, the merits and ensure how this works and think through what it might look like and, and if we need to adjust some of those levers and our requirements here i think that's an option um, a, a gentleman earlier mentioned the, the down payment assistance program and, and the kind of um, anti redlining component that just got it added on to it, but we do have resources through um, lending partners to make down payment assistance available for those who might be able to afford the monthly cost of a mortgage but can't come up with the down payment necessary to qualify for it. We don't want that to be a, a hurdle, right? So we've got program forgivable loans to support home buying um, under certain income senses. Um, you know, it, also thinking through, you know, it's, it's not feasible or re realistic that all of this can happen at once or even upfront before anything else happens, right? It's, it's likely that it needs to kind of happen over time. So thinking through what the prior, you know, among the, 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 the needs, the housing desires that we have, what should come first, right? What should be prioritized is kind of the early part if development were to happen versus what could be incorporated at a, at a later phase, you know, months, years down the road. Um, and then I think there's just a general expectation within our department of, of affirmative marketing, right? So, you know, especially for our income restricted units, it's not enough to just kind of list it on Craigslist or, or have it, you know, available on rent.com or whatever. We really expect that our owner and operators of, of affordable units really, you know, make make marketing materials available in different mediums and, and be proactive and reaching out particularly to the immediately surrounding community so that everybody knows what options are are available or might be available you know in six or eight or 12 months time right so that's kind of what we refer to as as affirmative marketing marketing and so again these aren't necessarily specific to park hill golf course but they certainly have applicability here and things to to keep in mind um, again, as we're deciding of, of what's most important here in the surrounding community to, to consider. And so thank you, Kenneth, for, for bringing that up. Um, and, and, and it's the same focus questions, right? I mean, which, which one of these ring true is really important to you, given this community, given this neighborhood, given this context, which ones aren't so important and why, and what other you know, ideas or priorities should we be considering? So just adding a few more conversation pieces, but let's continue. And then uh, Dr. Ross or Courtney, I'll trust you to make sure that we're transitioning appropriately to everything else we want to cover. Um, yeah. And before you, before you do that, Brad, I want to get one question from Mohammed in. Sure, I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Uh, Brad, a uh, quick question for you. Uh, the down payment assistance program, I don't know too much about it. Um, I have heard that um, if the you know the um, chef uh, down payment assistant program specifically mm -hmm. 
if they provide you a down payment assistance that does increase your increase your mortgage interest by certain number of points is that a, a fair statement there um so th again there are a variety of down payment assistance program chapa has one the one that the city operates and i'll put it into the um chat as we talk but it's metrodpa.org and the idea here is that these are actually interest-free second mortgages that are forgivable over three years and so effectively right they every month you live in your in your home um, which by the way doesn't have to be in denver it can be kind of throughout most of the kind of front range um if you will just kind of metro dpa approved um geographies and 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 the idea is that you know it's it's a second mortgage and it's it's kind of folded into your 30-year fixed rate kind of first mortgage and 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 the down payment assistance component is forgiven over 36 months and if you're there for three years you no longer have you know any any obligation to do and payable and so it's it's a it's a it's a cool program it's a different flavor than chapa is it's not better or worse it's just designed to be unique and different and and, and provide additional options thanks yeah we'll go ahead and can um uh, did you want these questions discussed um brad these focus questions sure yeah i mean the, the whole yeah i just i want to start to have this conversation as a steering committee you know having provided some context just so we can start to have a conversation around what's important and if i can't answer a question i've got a department of 100 you know plus people with experts across the board and we'll get back but um you know we're we're here to just help facilitate the conversation and and try to ensure that if there are important priorities that are generally agreed upon that we do everything we can to make sure that they're they're incorporated into any any future development that may happen here if it happens well, cool well, we, we've got about 15 more minutes in, in this section for you so just as yeah if you want to ask the questions or, or keep moving and just pick the questions up as they come but um i'll leave that i mean, to I mean the, the, we've gotten through my kind of my prepared material oh, i didn't okay. want to make it a, i don't, I don't want to be talking at you i wanted to have <laughs> Yeah, I want to. I want other people to be able to speak their minds and ask their questions and share their their thoughts. So, you know, let's okay. keep the conversation going. Great. Yeah, and I'm seeing some some comments in the chat uh, about needing space and uh, lots of housing types. Um, just looking at these focus questions for the st steering committee members. You know, do any of these things stand out? Um, is there something that you think is more important than the other, or just any thoughts in general on? Um, what Brad has what Brad has shared and uh, Lisa um yeah I guess not being a housing expert but it seems like I've heard in the past that things like condos and townhomes have been harder to have in Colorado and in Denver in particular is that still the case and does is that a are there other types of housing that are harder or easier to have that would therefore be something we would want to consider a little bit more so are area. you talking specifically to kind of um construction defect yeah i mean i don't know why i just like again i'm not an expert it just seems like i've heard that that like condos and townhomes are like the hardest thing to have in denver is what i've heard and i don't know the reasons why i'm just asking your advice um your feedback. Yeah, I mean, it, again, I, I am also an expert. I, I, Kenneth may be, frankly, more uh, in tune with this, having you know been on the development side. But I think that the, the reality is, yes, in our state, in our city, the relative portion of kind of you know attached for sale of condo and, and townhome developments are are much lower than in, in comparable communities because of this kind of risk of of litigation from construction defects and a, and a fear of being frankly sued and not having any ability to kind of provide remedy. And so it's it's scared a lot of developers away from providing that that housing type restricted or otherwise. Um, I don't know, Kenneth, if you want to add any color to that, but I, I, I'm sure you're- No, I, I, I mean, I think that's it. And then the the lack of townhomes is, is somewhat of a zoning thing. When the zoning code was updated in 2010, they eliminated the R2 zone, which allowed for a lot of duplexes and missing middle housing. Um, and the, currently the, the zoning code is primarily a single family, which doesn't necessarily support um, affordability. And but for example, I, I I've heard that you know the number of total um, for sale income restricted homes in Denver is less than two thousand, right? So just from a scale perspective and a data perspective in terms of the need, um, less than two thousand of the homes. And I think you know there there's clearly just a, a broad need across the city. Um, and I think the city's data shows a need for somewhere around 50,000 
affordable units citywide right now. Thanks. And, um, and Yeah, so I guess like the priorities for people are different because we're all come from different diverse backgrounds, which is great. But like, so I think that's why I think data would be good to have. But like for me, for example, like as a family, uh, you know, and like a, of a young child, a mother of a young child, education is important, right? Like right now my child is going to a school that is local and we're trying to do raise $40,000 to keep an art teacher, $40,000 to keep an art teacher an art teacher in our school that is, you know, Denver Public Schools. And I just think that to me, it's just crazy, right? Because she used to be in a private school before. So I'm just, I feel like what is like, I think the education for kids is important. So, and I know that a lot of that funding comes from property taxes, et cetera. So I think like knowing what kind of change is gonna happen to our kids or to people that are gonna be living here for 20 years longer than us, it's important to know, you know, like how many kids live in here, how many kids are going to be impacted by all of this. Like we, we need money to come to our neighborhood for those reasons. So I'm just, I feel like the priority is different for everybody, but I feel like the more we know about who, what's happening in the local community, it's important, right? To make the decisions, to make those kids like have their art teacher that we're trying to raise money for, which DPS can get or whatever it is, you know? It's just so frustrating to me. So I'm just, I feel like we just need to like, that's why I didn't want to become emotional with that decision because I think I want to see the data, but being living in this community, it's yeah. heartbreaking, right? So I'm just, I just wanted to say that out loud. Yeah, no, th thank you, Patty. That's it. It's, it's, it's very well said. Um, Courtney, I know, I, I don't know what's been distributed, but I believe some at least more specific area and neighborhood gap analysis is, has been done. I'm, I feel like I've seen it, but um, I don't know if that's been distributed, but it might be good to refresh the audience that of Arlene's work in analyzing kind of gaps and needs and, and some data. Yeah, definitely. So we have that study. It's available on the project webpage. Um, and we talked about it, I believe, last March or April around this time. Um, and that's that's been um, you know, discussed and also it's been made available. I can provide the link in the chat if you want to take a look at that more detailed information. It's pretty meaty, so it's hard to go into right now, but I'll, I'll put that in the chat. Other questions or comments from Brian, from the panelists? Okay. Well, see I'm, I'm going to stay on, Dr. Ross, and I'll be here yeah. throughout the rest of the meeting. And so if things come up, you know, I'm happy to awesome. chime in as needed. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you for, for the presentation and, and the information provided. Um, and, and thank you for staying on in case a question comes up um, as somebody's processing what they've heard. Um, we're going to transition over to Ryan um, to look at the revised site framework concept. Mm -hmm. Um, so just to kick off, I'll start. Um, I'm again, I'm Courtney Levington with CPD um, project manager. Um, we, you know, this next portion, we will be talking about the site uh, framework concept a little bit and what we heard. Also talking about housing affordability trade off. We want to receive, continue to receive your feedback on the amount of housing, the building height, you know, affordable housing, and discuss the trade offs needed to achieve the community's vision. Um, you know, to have the ability to deliver um, community serving needs like the open space, affordable housing, fresh food, um, that will you know, vary. There'll be various trades offs uh, depending on the level of density. Um, so what we'll show you not only is the, the site framework concept at a high level, but also three example test fits uh, to show different levels of density or building heights that can help achieve the vision. Um, so you should know that these are yeah, just test it and just example. So this is a tool um, to achieve the community's vision, you know, to understand that the level of density needed to support the future commercial and park spaces. Um, you know, the suggested range of affordability are high level estimates, like, and they can vary based on uh, numerous factors. So I just wanted to kind of tee up this conversation with understanding while you're looking at the, uh, the framework concepts and then the, the test fits as we're calling them, 
uh, with density and building heights, what you should be thinking about um, and what our goal is for this conversation. So with that, I'll hand it over to Ryan, um, our consultant with SIG. Thanks, Courtney. <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Ryan Sotarakis, an uh, urban planner and designer with Dig Studio. Mm -hmm. um, and first of all, I just want to thank you all for your collaboration, helpful feedback. We've gotten the past several meetings, and we really appreciate your dedication and thoughtfulness to this process. We know it's uh, a lot of information sometimes each meeting. So um, to start off with, we, we we want you to know that we we've heard you as we went through previous meetings and, and discussed uh, different uh, site plan framework uh, concepts. And so we've worked to address a lot of the comments that we've heard uh, in this option that you're seeing here. But I want I, we do want you to keep in mind that this is not a final site plan. This is just a possibility for how uh, the site may change in the future. Uh, and this plan will continue to evolve as we work toward a small area plan document um, and which will address framework concepts, building heights, uh, public space, and a lot of other elements. So um, also, I, if, if it's okay, we'd love to walk through just a few slides here, um, give, <clears throat> excuse me, give uh, some information to you, and then we can come back and we can jump back and forth to different slides to discuss if, if that's possible. Um, so what you're seeing here is, again, one possibility for the site. Um, a couple of the key things to keep in mind here are uh, that there's sort of these north and south neighborhoods um, divided by uh, future park and open space, and that the city grid is uh, extended uh, into the site um, following the same similar dimensions to uh, what it currently exists in the adjacent neighborhoods. Um, the future 303 artway is a big component of this um, running and actually maybe uh, no, uh, can't annotate, but that's okay. Um, there's some uh, uh, bullet points here. So future 303 artway uh, could potentially be a really great defining feature that uh, that forms the edge between future neighborhoods and the uh, future regional park and open space. Um, as well as allowing for trail connections and, and park access from all sides of, of the site. Um, the, a park that is visible to Colorado Boulevard was important and it opens up to Colorado Boulevard, uh, creating a, a really nice civic space with uh, views to the west. Um, no east-west uh, roadway through the site, so that was uh, an important uh, topic of conversation in previous Meetings. So potential uh, pedestrian and bicycle trail connections east-west, but no, uh, no automobile routes across, cutting through the park uh, east to west. Um, a retail town center, uh, if you will, that's fairly centrally located, right? So um, <clears throat> right here, we're showing it uh, along a, a potential 37th Avenue extending in from Colorado Boulevard. Again, this is just a concept that could um, certainly change, uh, but also extending down Colorado Boulevard to, to the corner of 35th to allow for uh, good visibility for retailers, um, potential future grocery stores, and any number of uh, amenities from Colorado Boulevard. Uh, and the last thing I want to point out here is a, uh, an open space buffer along Colorado Boulevard. You can see sort of there's a thin green strip uh, there that would help to improve the walking and biking experience north to south along Colorado, uh, as well as help to provide a little bit of a buffer from the, from the traffic noise as well. Uh, next slide, please. Great. <clears throat> so <clears throat> what we wanna talk about uh, this evening are uh, primarily a few different options to address building heights and how these uh, would impact future affordable housing opportunities. Um, so we'll go through these sort of three side by side, uh, and then I'll walk you through uh, pointing out some of the specific differences. So these maps that you're looking at are uh, color coded by building heights. So the darkest purple being the, the tallest, uh, no more than 12 stories. <clears throat> the next being up to eight stories. Uh, 
then to five and the lightest pink being up to three stories. Um, you'll see at the bottom that there are, based on the test fits that Courtney was discussing, um, we've looked at how uh, development types and models might fit into these, uh, these blocks and on the site and about how many units with the number of stories shown here you might be able to get overall. So on the left, this being sort of the, the, the lowest number of, of homes, about 2,000 to 2,500, with the potential that six to 900 of those could be uh, affordable homes in uh, any variety that uh, Brad previously discussed. Uh, the middle being a little bit more, uh, there's some taller buildings, a few more blocks of five-story buildings, uh, potentially 3,000 to 3,500 total homes with 900 to 1,300 uh, affordable, potentially. And on the far right, uh, you can see that uh, some, some additional uh, height and density at the northwest corner, 3,800 to, 3, to 4,300 total homes, about 1,200 to 1,700. <clears throat> I'm, I'm very sorry, excuse me, um, affordable homes. So Important, a couple things important to keep in mind here. These are based on uh, development scenarios that attempt to strike the right balance needed that would also provide the 75 to 80 acres of open space, as well as some retail opportunities on site for a uh, Main Street Town Center type of uh, neighborhood. Um, each one of these concepts could also include. Um, several of the options that, that Brad discussed earlier. So they, of, of affordable housing, right? So this may be some missing middle townhomes, uh, up to three stories, some workforce housing of three to five stories, senior affordable housing of five or more stories, uh, et cetera. So uh, as you can see, the number, the, <clears throat> the more total homes in the neighborhood, the more affordable homes can also be provided. Um, and then lastly, uh, important to note that the tallest uh, building opportunities and highest densities uh, concentrated to the northwest corner closest to the 40th and Colorado Station, and in all options, uh, dropping down to three stories along the east and the south along Future Park and the um, Northeast Park Hill neighborhoods across 35th Avenue. So <clears throat> next slide, please. I want to point out a couple of things here uh, in terms of the differences. So between option one and option two, um, what we're trying to highlight here is the difference that you might uh, get from uh, changing sort of block by block, right? So if you can see here this, this uh, one block just to the north of the, the park, um, if that was to go from a three-story uh, building to, or a couple of buildings to five stories, uh, that increases the number of homes from about 150 to about 250. Um, to the south side in the, uh, in a potential town center uh, district, if you go from three stories to five stories, and this again could apply to various different sites within uh, the overall area, but if you were doing three-story townhomes, you get about 60 to 70, 65 to 70 townhomes per block. Um, if you, if that goes up to five story buildings, uh, again, about 250 uh, homes in that block. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so then looking at moving from sort of the middle option to the, uh, the, the higher option, and you can see in the Northwest corner, where say some of the blocks that may be shown as eight story max buildings, if those were to go to 12 stories, um, and again, these are ranges, but about 225 homes to up to 335, maybe 350 um, per block. From five to eight stories, again, up from 250 to upwards of 400 potentially per block. And again, three to five, uh, same as the last time about 150 to 200. So um, hopefully this is kind of helpful to understand and visualize the, the differences. Uh, the more total homes on, on the site, the more affordable homes can be incorporated. So 
potentially uh, taller buildings uh, in the Northwest area allows for uh, an even greater number of affordable homes throughout the site uh, and then all options spread through three-story townhome to um, five-story to eight-story uh, apartment buildings. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> And here are, uh, whoop, back one. <laughs> Great, so these are some examples of uh, building form and massing uh, to communicate a sense of scale and how these building heights um, might feel within a future neighborhood. So it's important not to worry too much about the architecture here, but more about the size uh, and the massing and the scale of these buildings from the street. Um, we're trying to give you some examples of a variety of different uh, types of buildings that might occupy these, um, these blocks. So actually starting from the bottom, <clears throat> three stories may look like some three-story uh, uh, apartment home buildings. Um, these, <clears throat> excuse me, these could be smaller apartment buildings. They may have tuck under parking or parking in the rear on the surface. They could have various configurations. Um, they may include some community open space uh, within the block. Um, in the middle, three stories could also be uh, a form of townhomes. And one thing important about this to note is that the townhome configuration could actually have various uh, combinations of homes within them. So you may have three story townhomes side by side, you may have uh, the same three-story building form that the ground floor is a home and the second and third floor is a, another home. Um, you may have a configuration that uh, each floor is its own home. So there are a lot of different configurations that uh, can be applied to those to that building form. <clears throat> five stories, um, some examples here of what a five-story uh, building might look, of, look like. It could be one to two buildings per block. Um, if you're familiar with the, the center image here on the five story, that is uh, an affordable um, home community uh, by Union Station called Ashley Union Station. Uh, next slide. And lastly, getting to uh, towards the towards 40th in Colorado, um, eight story, 12 story buildings um, and the, these are you know, larger in scale, likely would occupy more of a full block, um, likely structured parking. Um, but an important thing to note here, if you look at all, all the images as well as the, the sort of 3D model is that um, one way to minimize the impact of these is to have the building step back, um, potentially at the fourth to fifth floor. Um, and so what that does is um, a couple of things uh, helps for the neighborhood streets to feel a little more open and airy, allows more sunlight to access, uh, to come down to the street level, um, but you can still have the, the, the density and um, larger number of homes on the block, but without feeling sort of like you're in uh, downtown with towers right along the street. Um, and it, again, importantly, just to reiterate that in all of these options, we've, we've looked at uh, the, the taller buildings concentrated to the northwest corner of the site, closest to transit, um, closest to Colorado Boulevard, and stepping down to three stories uh, in all options, potentially along the park and along the south side. Uh, so that was um, a bit of information, but I don't know if uh, anyone else from my team has anything they want to add to that. Um, but we would really love to sort of get your thoughts and, and hopefully you, you can see that there's a number of different configurations uh, that could that be applied here, but the important take home is that um, the more total homes uh, you have, the more affordable homes can be um, provided and um, all of these allow for this 75 to 80 acres of uh, open space and the potential for future neighborhood retail. So yeah, any uh, anyone else from my team want to grab 
throw in anything I missed or otherwise uh, we'd love to have a discussion and conversation about uh, your thoughts on this. We'll go to uh, Reverend Downing as your, uh, and, and then if somebody from the team chimes in, we'll go to them after Reverend Downing. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Thanks a lot, Ryan, for sharing tonight. It's really helpful and appreciate just the examples and you know the, what's what's being, I guess, considered and just kind of potential considerations. And the question I wanted to raise was uh, came out of our walkthrough um, as a steering committee of the golf course. And one of the, I think, common threads when we got to <clears throat> the backside of the course, uh, there was just the idea of viewways and even to the point you raised a moment ago about airiness and sunlight. And I guess my thought is with uh, those projections of sort of eight to 12 story buildings anchoring, which I understand from architectural and I guess even the, you know, just a sightliness perspective, those uh, taller elevations anchoring, uh, taller structures anchoring that, that north, um, east, northwest corner, forgive me, northwest corner, like how that impacts <clears throat> people who are further east in, in on the on the development and their ability to actually have airiness and uh, if those viewways will be visible at all unless you're on the top floor maybe sure so you know that that's a good point there are certainly trade-offs with these right so that's that's a, the crux of the conversation is uh, the, the different trade-offs I think that um, the, yeah, the airiness is more on the street level. Uh, and the, the point that we wanted to make about uh, making sure that if there are eight to 12 story, 12 story buildings, that there are architectural um, possibilities to where they aren't eight to 12 story walls on, on both sides, right? That the buildings can step back at, at typically that, that would happen about the fifth floor. Um, so from the street level, uh, a lot of times you don't even, if you're walking on a sidewalk, you don't even see the sort of tower, if you will, that is behind, um, that's stepped back. It seems like a five-story building. Um, views are views are a tough one. I, you know, it's, the views are sort of, uh, we, we've looked at ways to keep some of those view, view sheds available through the, the park and the open space in that central uh, park that comes out to Colorado Boulevard. Um, certainly the difference between three stories to say eight is uh, not huge, right? These aren't actually, I should not have actually said the word tower. They're not really towers. They're just, it, it's, it certainly is tough. I don't know if anyone else uh, has anything to add to, to the view conversation. Yeah, this is Bill with Dig. I, I would just also comment that, you know, we have a, as we all saw out on site, you know, a substantial amount of open space with the kind of the big finger of the park coming to Colorado. Um, that's over 300 feet at its smallest point in terms of the diagrams that you're seeing here. And then it widens as it comes further to the east into the site. So as one major view corridor, um, we're certainly preserving that kind of um, scale of, of a view west into the mountains. Uh, I think this can be looked at as um, further refinement to a site plan occurs that, you know, maybe rather than one big one, it could be two smaller ones or the, the roadway right of ways could become wider. Um, I think that's the other key thing to note is that those roadway right of ways that align with uh, 37th, 36th, um, kind of the open, the, the big open space in the middle is 38th. And then, uh, two more as we go north between 38th and 40th, those roadway right-of-ways also serve as view corridors uh, to the mountains to the west. So I think through a variety of, of really scaling those open space fingers and uh, the proper width of the right-of-ways that the view corridors could be preserved um, or enhanced, I mean, effectively. Um, and that was really part of this idea of the city grid concept is that we have preserve that's the street alignment and we have multiple spots you know we have uh, really from 40th to the south um, you know six different kind of corridors that orient to the west to preserve those views 
And then, you know, the architecture as that evolves and an ultimate plan in terms of how it step backs, how it, uh, how the edges um, articulate themselves. I think um, that gets into a level of detail that, um, uh, you know, could be a part of the, um, you know, kind of requirements of further planning is to, to, you know, preserve those few corridors, you know, moving forward. I appreciate that. Um, thank you very much for that insight. <clears throat> that that is helpful. Even seeing, I guess, the three hundred feet or so. And I guess just for just for sharing's sake, I think what we were thinking about as we did the walkthrough was the idea that we don't want to create inequities of residents, you know, as it relates to those viewways. So that if I'm not on the street level, but if I'm in my residence, and if I have to be at a certain um, height of you know development to be able to see. I just think it's sort of what we discussed on the walk was it's kind of like, you know, it's Colorado. It's, it's a part of who we are as a community. Mm -hmm. And if views are sort of, you know, uh, come with a price tag, which obviously that's a part of our society. But I think what we talked about that day was just the importance of some equity there, uh, both for airiness and sunlight and viewways. And obviously those are big asks, but I think uh, maybe if we're living in, in another state, but Colorado, it's, it's, it's a huge part of who we are. So just a thought mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Yeah. Good comment. Lisa? Yeah. Um, so first related to the height and the views, I, I do think that if there's the height, um, that it does make sense to have it on that side where you've got it on that north end, because the folks that back sort of into it um, on the east side, I think that's mostly warehouses as opposed to one story residential mm -hmm. homes, which is more the case as you go further south. Um, so I do think when you have the height and you're considering views, I think that that's probably, you know, I'm guessing that that's where you have the least impact is where you've put it. Um, I think the thing that is a little, I would love to see a little more um, playing with the idea of this, when you have that park that's sort of running from east to west down the middle from Colorado, what it kind of made me think of is you've separated two communities that you've got the north and you've got the south. And then there's this big chasm of greenery in between. And while I, I love open space, I almost would love to have, you know, some consideration for a little bit more stepping down and connectivity and I don't know, um, things that would like encourage people to like move into that space, um, whether, you know, whether that's through retail or, you know, um, coffee shops or whatever that is. But it just, I would hate to see that be sort of a hard edge. Like here's where all the housing is, here's where all the retail is. And now we've got this big expanse right down mm -hmm. the middle. I just think it's gonna cut the community in half going that direction, but. Um, and then it's a comment that I've wanted to make for a while, frankly, ever since we had our on-site visit is I was a little concerned about the answers that I got from parks when we talked about the regional detention. So I just want to bring that up since I have the opportunity. Um, I really hope that it seems like, well, this is what the regional detention is right now. And if we want it, you know, and, and there's almost like a disconnect between what the city like this, I would really like us to make sure our regional detention there actually makes sense in the context of what else is in that park area and that they are not thought of as two separate things. I, I would hate for that park, the regional park to be sort of separated from the detention and that the two should make sense together and that we should not be bound by what's there right now in the regional detention and that we should still allow creative thinking about what ends up there. That's still detention, but that is also makes sense for what the rest of the area is there. So those are my comments. Lisa, I can try to answer um, those, those two questions and maybe um, Owen from, from Parks could jump in as, as well. Um, to your, your question about the, the 300 feet along Colorado, um, that's the open space. I, I think it, that's a really good, good point. Um, and it's difficult at a, um, the level of detail that we have on this illustrative graphic to really understand what that will look or feel like um, when it would actually get, get built. Um, I think the intent there is to have uh, some sort of connectivity of the, the, the regional park off of Colorado um, so you can access the park from, from 
the major arterial street. Um, but what that character may look like with especially regional um, park-like facilities, whether that's a, a larger field house or other um, regional um, draws that would 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 you know come there, it could look very different than just a big open field. And yeah. So it's very yeah. difficult to really show that here, and we and we haven't had the time or you know um, be able to really think through that. That's what a master park plan process would would get mm -hmm. us to. But there's a lot more thought that we need to go into that, and I think that would knit those two different neighborhoods really together into actually maybe a focal point. Um, it, to your point about the regional detention facility, we've been hearing that loud and clear over the last several months oh, uh, and have been working closely with DPR, uh, Denver Parks and Rec, as well as the Department of Infra uh, Transportation and Infrastructure, DOTI. Um, and so uh, we, I would hope to have a, a recommendation in the plan that we can explore how to integrate that fully into the park space. Um, we need to figure out the technical uh, aspects of that. And there's um, some elements we need to figure out to make sure it will work, but we will want to explore that. Howdy. Yeah, I think hey, this is Owen. I think actually David, you did a great job of covering that. Thanks. Um, and some, some of this is tough. I know it's tough for Ryan and the dig team because, um, you know, the, they're trying to show a park um, but to David's point, we do a pretty extensive park design process um, when we go into this, and it will not feel like a void. It won't feel like open um, fields. And in fact, most of the times when we're we're d designing our parks, and they are in themselves sort of connective tissue. And I think we could. Um, I think there's pretty great opportunity, sort of along the lines of what you're talking about, to make this a really active space um, with a variety of uses, whether it's civic, whether it's uh, retail, whether it's residential and sort of our big park activity zones. Uh, at the same time, we did hear loud and clear from some of the um, earlier steering committee, uh, community open house and some of the navigators um, that it was also important for communities on the west side, like that this park should be a place of, you know, joining. Um, and so that's a little bit of that Colorado frontage reflects that too. Um, and yeah, in terms of the detention, um, you know, we are, we're, interested to see a different future there as well. Um, I think we, collectively as a city, we can make that better. Uh, the details of that we'll have to sort of work out over time. But as David said, I think it's a, a relevant plan um, kind of recommendation and what that exact treatment looks like is will take quite a bit of technical work and understanding to understand um, how you accommodate that volume, um, what it will take financially. And if there's other sort of, um, maybe softer ways to integrate that park space with the detention, but totally, totally with you, that should function uh, as a kind of collective open space. And I think we're uh, excited that the steering committee has talked about that and that the park sort of parameters and framework that have been established so far through your guys' work over the last half a year kind of leaves that potential open, right? We have the park space kind of budding up there and I think it leaves potential to do interesting things. Thanks Owen and David for that, yeah. I'm going to go to Patty with a question. Yeah, I am glad that the conversation for the attention, uh, regional attention center, is, it's, it's there now. But I also do want to just ask, I was just, it seemed to me, or it seems to me that we only had two options of like what this could look like, you know, and we came out with the best option because we wanted to have like a open area to where we can have the views, et cetera. But I guess what I'm I, maybe because this is difficult to put in in, a, in an image like this, but I just kind of wanted more creativity of what else could be instead of just buildings in one side, buildings in the other, and then the park. I just I think this is such an, a great opportunity for design to be involved. And I just is this the only option we have because this is the better of the two? You know what I mean that we had. So that was just I don't know. Maybe that's just my own opinion. So. Well, Patty, I, let me, this is Bill with Dig, I'll just try to respond and then maybe uh, David and others can jump in on this as well. But, um, you know, the, the, these kind of what we refer to as test fits or framework plans, you know, begin to organize the general layout of roads, the general layout of open space, um, the um, edge conditions where we uh, abut existing uh, housing and development. Um, and so by no means are these meant to be, 
you know, a final site plan where we, you know, you literally take this and then it's, you know, goes into detailed construction documents. There will be, um, we're really trying to, to establish here through this, these test fits is to, in our primarily our discussion tonight is a focus on the, um, the number of uh, op or, uh, options for the quantity of homes that we could fit in uh, relative to the height of buildings, uh, but the actual block pattern and the, you know, the, the, the open space alignments, you know, and connection points, that all will evolve as we, um, that comes after, you know, this effort, which is really creating a small area plan. So the more detailed site plan efforts will come uh, as a next step of more detailed planning. Um, I think what we're, we're really trying to establish now are, are the basic parameters of this framework that, um, that the, the whole community um, in this, the task force buys into, the steering committee um, uh, supports here. And, and so this, you know, please, as Ryan said at the beginning, please don't take these as, as a final plan. I mean, it, it's a, it's a big moves in saying yes, connections to the existing neighborhoods, east, or I'm sorry, west, south, north are important in terms of the, the broader fabric that is the grid um, of Denver. But the, you know, the, the final uh, block size and arrangement that will all come in the next steps planning. Um, but more of this framework will be in the small area plan, which is really the task where we're all uh, charged with at, at the moment. Yeah, that, that's well said, Bill. Um, just to, to highlight there that, um, yeah, I mean, this is an illustrative graphic, I'm just trying to illustrate what could happen. Uh, the exact street grid and, and block formations might vary, um, but we're trying to capture, um, you know, what could happen. Uh, broadly speaking, D to remind everyone, um, you know, we've been at this now for uh, several months. We started with three, actually, um, the first time, and then we showed the community that in our first uh, community workshop, we had all three options, um, and then, then we went down to two, um, uh, ref refining those down to two, and then now we're trying to, trying to get to one that generally captures uh, what we're trying to achieve. And then that would translate to what we'd start to put in the plan with our future places map and in the building heights map. Um, and so um, it's really just to help us facilitate the discussion to get us to a point where we can have a draft plan. Um, and, and Patty, if, if, you know, the, if there's other things that we're missing here from a creativity standpoint, I'd love to love to hear your, your thoughts on, on maybe something that you saw earlier that you, you, you kind of wish was still in or or any of that type of stuff. We're happy to continue the conversation as we kind of refine it over the next few months. Thank you. I mean, by no means I'm a city planner or anything, but I just kind of, I just wanted to say that, I don't know. Other, other thoughts, questions, comments? Okay. Any reaction to height shown here generally? Or even number of affordable homes as it relates to the height? And especially in light, if I could add on Cordy, in light of what Brad shared earlier in terms of his whole discussion about affordable housing types and um, needs. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like for is, I think that the purpose of this meeting today is for like to to talk about affordable housing, but I feel like a lot of things like the community, town square, etc, things that we have talked about in the past are not included in this. So I don't know that this, uh, you know, I don't know that this is the right time to talk about those because like you guys said, this is mainly all about affordable housing, right? And that what could be versus what is not, or I don't know if if I'm correct in that. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think that's right. And in, in that the next um, go around, we we've kind of uh, we'll bring this all together. I, 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 you know, the the logic behind this, we've we've thrown a lot of planning 101 at you all in a very short period of time in terms of how this uh, planning process normally works. And uh, I apologize, I realized it wasn't on video this whole time. Right. Um, sorry about that. Um, so we, we've been throwing a lot at you and, we, and we've been very impressed with how you've grasped this. So it's kind of been in almost um, um, digestible chunks of when we first talked about parks and what you'd like to see in a park. And then mm -hmm. we've talked about, um, uh, we talked about uh, retail and the need for retail and com other community amenities. And then now we've focused on on housing and affordable housing. And we've talked about transportation and transportation networks. And so we've kind of broken this down into whole segments, if you will, or almost chapters of a book uh, around each one of these components. And uh, yes, our next step based on all the good feedback we've gotten over each one of these steering committee sessions is to bring this together in our June meeting uh, where this all begins to kind of weave together in terms of these framework component pieces of, of mm -hmm. mobility, of parks, of affordable housing, of retail and other community amenities. So yeah, I, I appreciate your desire to want to see it all. Uh, again, we've kind of purposely broke it down into these pieces so that it's not um, overwhelming through the process we've gone to and you've done a great job of providing feedback. But yeah, the next step uh, or the next session will bring bring all these things together. Uh, oh, hopefully Lisa. that makes sense. Ken and then Lisa. Yeah, thanks. You know, I, I, I appreciate the, the attempts here. I think maybe if we could, you know, we're trying to have a trade-off discussion yet there isn't a, a lot of differences between these plans. And, and I think what I was hearing from some other folks is, um, you know, to put it into planner speak. And I think the, the biggest challenge is that, you know, most of the folks on this committee are not planners. So it's hard to, I think they've been doing a great job of absorbing this, this information, but some of the trade-offs and thinking are, for example, is the Colorado Boulevard frontage more important than depth of the park from the overlook, you know, to, to where development begins or where the 303 R way is. Uh, some other questions I think that could be really focused is what does that edge look like, right? Right now, the plan shows retail ending before it gets to any of the park. Um, it seems like there, there's an opportunity there that I'm hearing that could really activate uh, the park and, and people wanting to have that be, you know, activated and, and, and lead to destinations. Um, I'm also hearing that, you know, um, that, that maybe there's um, a thought about, you know, and, and, and I like the thought of this 303 R way here, but what, you know, what does that mean? And, and how can we, um, you know, utilize that for multimodal connections? Um, it, it feels, you know, to, to um, I think those of us who were out on the uh, site tour that Colorado Boulevard certainly doesn't feel like a great uh, place to hang out in a in a park, and so I guess that that's one of the questions of, you know, would 35th be an interesting gateway for uh, for folks coming from existing neighborhoods um, to enter, while also being cognizant of east west connections to the Clayton neighborhood, which we've also heard is desirable. Um, you know, I think maybe maybe it would be easier if there were some more direct kind of questions about that uh, for, for folks to opine on, because we really want to hear um, that feedback as well. Um. Just is there a response for, for Ken before we go to Lisa? Yeah, just a I I think all those questions are very valid and we're we're, we're here to discuss. This is what we want to have uh, as a conversation with the steering committee. 
about um, not even just all those questions, but just simply the basic questions about, you know, the building heights. I mean, which one of these three options feels right to you? Um, are, are we missing something, right? Um, you know, thinking back about uh, some of the slides that Ryan showed of the different um, building types and housing types, you know, does that make sense um, on where they're, they're mapped out here on, on these locations? Uh, the retail is a great question that Kenneth brought up. Should that be brought closer to the park on the southern edge? Those are all things that would really help us um, inform uh, the next iteration of, of this um, as we go forward. Lisa? Oh, you're on mute, Lisa. Sorry. Um, okay. So when in asking that question of what feels right, I think the information that I don't have, not being someone super experienced on this level of um, development is, for example, if you were, if, if say your option number two in the middle where you have more um, five-story stuff in the retail district on that south end, I don't know what that looks like for the people who live in the residential homes because um, to the east of them, because there's this huge green expanse in between. And I remember when we did our site visit that having some distance made a huge difference in how impactful a taller building felt. So I wish there were a way for us to have almost like a, a ground level kind of understanding of what those kind of things would look like for people from various viewpoints. And it's not I mean, I, I'm not trying to say that nothing can happen if it blocks someone's view because, um, you know, I mean, shoot, the some of these houses were built in front of other people's houses <laughs> when they were built. Um, but um, but so that's my one thing. I think it's hard for me to say what the density level should be um, for that um, because I don't know what that really means for people. Um, and it could be that there's a mix um, and it's not all you know, you have a little more density in this, uh, in like the section, what you have for your second option, where you have more higher five story in that Southern area, but maybe you don't have more density on that 40th level area. So I think there's some mix and match opportunities there. Um, and then I do wanna go back to the idea of the retail. I do think it, again, I'm, I'm hearing that you guys will um, finesse this a bit when you actually get to more detail, but it does feel like it's a bit chopped off. And that, you know, here's the retail and here's the housing. And I, I would love to have hopefully get to a point where we're seeing a little bit more, you know, of what that mix would look like so that it's not all, all or nothing. Yeah. And, and Lisa, maybe that's a good point. And let me just clarify too, that um, when we talk about retail, and I think we've had conversations about this in some of our previous sessions, um, you know, we're looking at a lot of this retail to be integrated into the ground floor um, as part of a true mixed use building. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, mixed use retail, incubator, you know, small business kind of space at the ground floor of these buildings with residential above. Mm -hmm. Right, And you can see that in these precedent images where we're showing, you know, like maybe there's a little bit um, like on that ground floor to those taller buildings on the corner here. Even. So it's not just, um, you know, pure residential building. Mm -hmm. right. right. So we're creating that street activation. And, um, and the other thing, um, again, not to, uh, I guess as a, as a planner, we, we look at these things. The other thing that, that you, this plan be, at least in, in, in our eyes begins to, um, uh, suggest is a, a block pattern that is very walkable, that, you know, it, 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 it is that mixed use of buildings, but, uh, vertically, um, uh, really allows in the, in the pattern of the blocks themselves and kind of the, the, uh, tightness of those blocks, if you will, allows for a much more walkable condition, um, so that everybody's not getting in a car to drive three blocks to the to the grocery store or the dry cleaner or you know the the uh, sandwich shop that um, a big big part of this idea in this framework of this plan is to really increase the walkableness the walkability of this uh, of these new neighborhoods that would, the new neighborhood that would be created Patty? yeah and with that and talking about the retail, 
side of it too. I mean, I think it definitely needs to be incorporated into the park because to be honest, I mean, having a cup of coffee on Colorado Boulevard doesn't sound like something I want to do or anything else. So I think for those businesses to be successful and for the for the community to go to those places, have to it has to be integrated with the park as well as it has to be places that we want to go to, right? Like we were talking about like community own retail spaces, et cetera. And I think for me to have it just on Colorado Boulevard is too commercial and and it's not community driven. It's just whoever some Colorado Boulevard stops there and that's it. That's a, it's a really good comment, Patty and, and both Lisa. Um, so we can definitely look more closely at the retail district, but I think, you know, I think Bill is also getting to the point that, I mean, I think there could be opportunities for more um, individual, um, smaller retail opportunities uh, elsewhere within the site. Um, you know, it could be mixed use across the board with residential focus on the north side, but it doesn't mean that's completely void of maybe some retail opportunities, especially with the ideas of um, uh, incubator space or, or other uh, local business development that could be supported by those um, those neighborhoods. So um, really good point. I know we're probably getting a little low on time here, and I do want to make sure we maybe have a little bit more conversation about the affordable housing uh, numbers. So Brad can get some input on that. I'd love to hear if if those numbers that uh, we were looking at through the three different variations, if anything in particular stood out to anyone on the steering committee with the, with the amount of affordable housing that could be attained here. There you go. Yeah, that slide does the best though. Thanks. What are folks thinking, right? When you look at, I guess, the townhomes, you look at the, the apartments, the, the different sizes, the five stories versus eight versus 12. Um, just kind of what are your gut feelings, you know, as it relates to that in terms of the housing? I guess my, my gut feeling on these three and the number of affordable housing increasing with the density of the, the concept um, seems like the option three, the third concept would could potentially provide for more diversity in housing type that is affordable. I don't know if that's actually what I'm seeing here, but it, you know, it does seem like, you know, as the number of affordable housing units goes up, then it's not all going to be one type of affordable housing, as in the, the building type. So it won't, it'll be a little bit more integrated into the overall community rather than kind of isolated by building, which I think, I guess this is simply my opinion, feels like a better situation for community, um, creating community fabric in a dense location um, than, you know, if you have fewer options. Yeah, uh, Shandi, thank you. I think your, your assumptions there are absolutely Correct, right? I mean, I think the point here is just trying to be made is that kind of as you know, affordable housing types, or I'm sorry, as as kind of just housing types and and, and scale increase, the same is true for affordable housing, right? So the more the more that's there, the more options and typologies exist. But that again comes with trade-offs in terms of you know view planes and accessibility, right? And again, I you know, we're not here to prescribe important, we're here to try to facilitate you know, the, the best possible outcome and, and provide some assurances that what's committed to in terms of affordability is, is met, but it, you know, I mean, there's, we have great need, but there's more needs in the city than just, than just housing, right? This is important to have these kinds of conversations, but your, your observation is spot on. Other thoughts? 
Uh, Dr. Ross, we do have Will Wanglander um, from David Evans Associates. I know that um, Shanta did have a question about how these potential densities and thinking about traffic. Mm -hmm. Um, did you want to, are you able to ask that verbally or? No. Are you, so were you, were you saying you wanted Will to speak to that now? If Shanta was interested in hearing from him. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, Courtney. Um, yeah, I mean, I would love to if he's able to answer it now. If not, if there's a time that's that's planned to to specifically address um, the traffic implications, I just wanted to know when that would be, um, because I know at some point I would like to hear a, a, a comprehensive traffic um, analysis. Mm -hmm. Certainly. And, and Shanta, that's definitely a pertinent question. Um, and, and we have started our analysis and I can kind of begin to share where we're at, but you know, at the June meeting is when we'll have a much more complete analysis uh, that will be in part informed by the number of units that we're working with here um, and, and getting to that. You know, uh, we're modeling the, the scenario three, which has the most number of homes because we really wanted to be conservative and that would obviously have more impacts on the transportation network. And you know, as expected, it does impact the level of service of a, of, of a number of intersections in, in the roadway network around the site. Um, but we've also looked at mitigations and, and there's things that we can do um, that, that can kind of address some of these impacts as part of the development. And that could be anything from uh, signal timing adjustments to, to infrastructure improvements and improving those intersections. Uh, and those are called geometric improvements. And those are things that we can look at as mitigations relative to it. Um, but just as an update, what we've modeled is 35th and 40th uh, currently, um, and it will definitely impact both of those intersections. Um, but, you know, future development in this project is an opportunity to maybe address some of those capacity issues that, that are occurring now. Um, uh, we definitely have heard you loud and clear that there is a number of capacity issues around the area, particularly there at 40th and at 35th. Um, so, you know, this is an opportunity to, to kind of fix those things. And, and we're aware that we're going to have to improve the roadway network, as well as mobility in general, uh, to make this a place that fits with the community. Um, so uh, with that, you know, we also want to kind of talk about with traffic, also those safe multimodal connections. So in addition to looking at 35th and 40th, which are starred here, um, we're, we're looking at, uh, at the intersection at 37th or 38th understanding that there's a really uh, strong association in, in a need to connect this park in the amenities and the development to the Clayton neighborhood. Uh, so we'll be looking at an intersection in that area that would be signalized uh, at, to some extent to provide those safe multimodal connections to the amenity. And then we're also gonna be looking at, at, I guess what we're calling the 40th and Albion connection. And that's on the north side there where we're getting, uh, where we're suggesting removal of that curvature and, and creating a three-way intersection that would be stop controlled or have some sort of traffic control uh, there to, to understand how that could both improve the existing condition there at 40th and Colorado, but also, you know, what the impl implications for the larger neighborhood would be. Um, so, you know, at our meeting in, in June, we'll have so, some much, uh, uh, or pithy, I guess, uh, analysis for, for the steering committee to review related to the impact we heard today and then our ongoing modeling efforts. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that quick little segue. I didn't want to forget about you in the chat. <laughs> yep, happy to, Shanta. Thank you. Appreciate Rosa. it. <laughs> thank you, Shanta and Courtney. Thank you all. Um, we're, we're, we're getting close to the end, but we do have um, public comment, but before we go there, I just wanted to make sure there were no uh, no final thoughts or questions um, on 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 uh, the the affordability that we were just talking about for Bill or mm -hmm. Ryan or Brad. Yeah, we definitely would love to hear. You know, um, the density desired is this. You know, the amount of affordability the ability to accept the additional density for more affordability in that priority. Where are we at? Yeah, and so 
Uh, Patty. Yeah, I, I think for me it's definitely the density. It's it probably is it probably just brings a lot of stress to the community. But you know, I know there's a need for a lot of housing, so I don't know. I think that would be the first thing we should just be careful about with the community, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. and, and I know, and I know this was a lot of information and just great information. And so some of you are processing and thinking about it. And so, you know, if you have questions or comments that you want to send in via email, um, you know, over the next few days, uh, don't hesitate to do that as well. Um, just because, you know, again, this was this was definitely a lot. And so there may be some thoughts or some aha moments or just additional questions that arise as you're thinking about this over the next few days. And so if you get those, just send those in. So you can send them to me or you can send them to Courtney and then we'll make sure they get to the appropriate people. Um, thank you all uh, very, very much. Now we're going to transition. We have um, public comment next and we have uh, one person tonight for public comment, and her, her name is Amy Harris. Courtney, is she with us? Yeah. Hi, I think Hi. so. Yep. Oh, there she is. I, I, I'm... <laughs> Hi, I'm so honored to be your, your lone speaker tonight. Um, uh, thanks for having me. I'll keep it real brief. I just, um, going back to the, um, the park discussion, I just, um, I had a question I was thinking about um, I'm not really clear on how how the park will work exactly if um, who's taking on the the burden of the cost to construct the park and all the amenities that are going to go into it um, that we've talked about, you know, like pavilions and ball fields and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then will the land itself will will that be land that's, you know, donated and turned into public land or will it have to be sold or I just I have a lot of questions about how exactly that works because it's sort of an unusual um, you know situation with um, a private landowner creating a public park. I'm just not really sure how that um, how that partnership works. So I was hoping that that could just be addressed in a in a future meeting to you know to kind of figure out how exactly that works and who's who's paying for what. Um, and then just just very briefly, I just wanted to mention too that um, we learned a little bit about that um, the new affordable housing that's going in um, at 40th in Colorado or just north of 40th in Colorado. And although we don't know the number of units, um, they are seeking uh, five to eight story buildings on that parcel as well. So there's also going to be some towers going in there. Um, so just good to to keep in mind. And I appreciate having some context about the. Um, the additional development that's going on around the land, because um, I think that really helps to understand how much um, of, if any, of the open space we want to sacrifice um, for the sake of housing, if there are other places we can put it. And that's it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. Well, great. Well, Amy was our, our only public comment person for tonight, and it's right at 727, so we're in a you know, give you three amazing minutes of your evening back. Um, I hope these are the best three minutes that you've ever had. Um, but um, we'll be following up with um, just some information on um, meeting in person. We'll do some researching and get back to you on that. We'll also uh, look at potential dates or, or, you know, looking at if we can get out for one more site visit. And, um, and then other than that, we'll be in touch and our next meeting is in June. Um, it is June 14th, is that correct? Yes, June, yes. June, four, June 14th at 5.30. And um, we'll plan on seeing you then. And, and if we're gonna be virtual or in person is yet to be decided, but we'll get that figured out between now and then. And if there's any more thoughts about that as well, please don't hesitate um, to shoot me a, a note or shoot Courtney a note. Um, so we can have that information as well. With that, thank you all and have a great evening. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.